Hello and welcome to my channel. I'm 99% positive you don't know me, and I probably don't know you. But regardless of that, in this video I'm going to explain and provide context for the Scott Pilgrim Iceberg. So if you're not entirely familiar with the comic or the movie, then I'd advise you to close this video, go read the comic or watch the movie and come back to me. If you haven't been living under the rock for the past year, you probably already know what an iceberg is. And if you were, then I can just go ahead and explain it for you. An iceberg is a form of representing certain concepts in a simplified form. This can range from theories to facts and all that. But the general idea is that the top of the iceberg is more or less common knowledge, and the stuff at the bottom is rather obscure and less known. This format may be a bit dead by now, but well, this specific iceberg popped up rather recently on Reddit and I want to speak about it. Before I start, I just want to give a massive shout out to the one and only Night Fury Witch, a Reddit user who actually created this iceberg to begin with. They also helped me with scripting this video, so I can say with full certainty that this video wouldn't have actually ever been made if it wasn't for them. Thank you again, and let's begin with the iceberg. Also, I hope you don't mind, but I'm going to play some League of Legends in the background, since I don't have that much stuff to put anywhere, so this is gonna just act as the background for the video. Layer number one. The movie. This is probably self-explanatory. Scott Pilgrim vs. The World got a movie adaptation in 2010. It was directed by Edgar Wright. I hope I didn't just butcher his name. Unfortunately, the movie completely flopped. It lost about $75 million, though some other sources suggest that it might have been $50 million. Either way, it's a huge shame that it wasn't too popular back in the day. I mean, it's a genuinely awesome movie and I think it deserves more love. As of recording this video, you can actually watch it on Netflix. Video game references. As we all know, Scott Pilgrim is filled with video game references. Those include, but may not be limited to, pixelated Universal logo, the sex bob -omb, probably being a reference to Mario's bob -omb's, the Zelda music at the beginning of the movie, Ninja Ninja Revenge as a rather obvious reference to Dance Dance Revolution, also, Final Fantasy boss music played on the bass by Scott after dumping Nice. The rather more obvious references to the Street Fighter and plain mentions of Pac-Man in Scott's pickup line. The game. Yet another self-explanatory fact, there exists a game adaptation of the comic published by Ubisoft. The first game came out in 2010, followed by a DLC, which included Nice Chow and Wallace Wells as playable characters. Both of these came within the span of 3 years. Over 10 years after the initial release, it has been decided to publish a complete edition. Basically a version that already includes the 2 DLC. And so it came out on 14th of January 2021. Knife's Alternate Ending As the name suggests, it's an alternate ending where Scott actually ends up with Knife Chow and not Ramona Flowers. This ending is currently available on YouTube if you're curious how it looks. This ending is also the sole reason why Ramona isn't exactly as likeable as she is in a comic. The writers decided to make her a bit more cold and less approachable because they wanted the viewer to have less sympathy for her. Of course, this version hasn't been implemented in the movie because it would directly clash with the original ending in the comic. Fredzilla Fredzilla is an unofficial name for the original ending, or at least the most notable part of it, from the original script for the movie which we will be getting into later. In this, after a quick hand-to-hand -hand fight, Gideon grows to a kaiju size and has to be taken down by the team of Scott, Ramona and Knives. He ends up getting defeated after Knives admits her love for Scott. The reason why it was changed was because of budget reasons. Cause, as you can probably imagine, it would have been pretty expensive to say the least, to film Gideon wrecking downtown Toronto. While no footage for this ending exists, you can read the draft script and as a result, this version of the ending fairly easily. Numerology with 7 evil exes As most of us probably already know, numbers play a rather big role in the story, especially when speaking about the League of Evil Exes. For instance, Matthew Patel has a fringe covering one of his eyes, signature pose is pointing with one finger, he kissed Ramona only once, and the demon hipster chicks that he summoned are all wearing a t-shirt with one single star, and the movie score also gains 1000 points from defeating Matthew. Kusli, the second evil boyfriend, has a number 2 on his car, the staircase on which he lost his battle with Scott, has exactly 200 steps. 
in the movie though, he also has a number 2 tattooed on his neck and he points at Scott with two fingers. Scott gains 2000 points from defeating him. As for Todd, the third evil ex, he has had three girlfriends in the past that we know of. He's also seen wearing a t-shirt with the number 3. He also faces Scott thrice and the first brawl between them happens around 3.30. In the movie adaptation, he only plays three notes on his bass solo, describes vegan diet by not eating three things, meat, breast milk and ovum, and he loses his vegan powers after three strikes. Shockingly, after winning with him, Scott gains 3000 points. Fourth evil ex, Roxy Rocher, appears in four locations in the comic and misses Scott four times in their first fight. It is also mentioned that by the time Roxy appeared, Scott and Ramona have been dating for about 4 months. In the movie, the bar in which Scott and Roxy fight is literally called 4. Inside the bar there are 4 disco balls. What I also think is worth mentioning is that in the movie the spelling of her name has been edited. I was not sure, it may be caused by the fact that they wanted to have her name have 4 letters instead of 5 like the original comic did. Yet again, surprisingly, Scott gains 4000 points from defeating her. Kyle and Ken Katayanagi, twins, fifth and sixth exes of Ramona. As you can probably tell, their names start with a K, which is also the 11th letter of the alphabet. And it makes sense considering that they are together, because 5 plus 6 equals 11. This may be a reach for some, but I think it's so worth mentioning. Another thing about them is that they are represented by a dragon, which is actually the fifth zodiac sign. And in the movie, during their fight with Scott, they could only maximize their volume to 11. Also, they have the number 5 and 6 on their cuffs. This time, Scott scores 5,000 and 6,000 from them. Eddie and Graves. Last but not the least, 7th Evil X. Arguably, he has the most references to numbers of all evil exes. For instance, it is revealed that Gideon has actually seven ex-girlfriends, seven years older than Scott and Ramona. The first letter of his first name is also the seventh letter of the alphabet. In the movie, the Chaos Theater that he owns also is called Seventh Level. His half bar is split into seven parts. Seven guards around him and states that a swallowed gum takes seven years to digest. Which is not true. Keep in mind though that these aren't all the references that we see in the movie. I just chose the ones that I found most interesting or made the most sense because I didn't want this video to take 10 hours. X imagery in the movie. The X symbol in Scott Pilgrim movie bears the significance of representing the overall idea of the evil X's. For this reason, it appears a lot in the backgrounds of the movie. Like for example, in the beginning credits, we see two X's. The back of Lucas Lee's jeans also have two X's on them. Roads on which Scott walks make an X shape. We can also see numerous signs with X's on them. Honestly, I think it's one of the greatest things about this movie. Like, the attention to detail is amazing. Brie Larson's version of Black Sheep. The song that appears on Envy's concert is Brie Larson's cover of the song by Metric. And while the entire soundtrack was released right after the movie aired, for some reason they left out this one song and didn't upload for years. And finally, in May 2021, it has been officially released. 10 years after the movie aired. Sequel ideas. Well, a sequel to Scott Pilgrim vs. The World never came out. There still have been ideas, namely by the actors, for a new release. For instance, Mary Elizabeth Winstead said that she would love to see a sequel that includes all the characters 10 years later. She claimed that she wanted to see the contrast between young adults in their early 20s and the same people later in their lives. Even Michael Cera, the actor who played Scott himself, stated that he would love to take part in a sequel. And while I personally doubt that a sequel would ever come out, who knows, maybe one day we'll see one. So, we finally finished layer 1. So now... Layer 2 The game was Lost Media. As I mentioned before, one of the comics adaptation was a game. Even though it's easy accessible now, it wasn't always the case. By the end of 2014, it was deleted from the PlayStation Store and the Xbox Live Arcade. And considering that PC release didn't exist at the time, the game was considered Lost Media, since only those who already had it installed could ever play it. After almost 6 years, however, the game came back with its completed edition. Differences between the books and the movie It's pretty obvious that a barely 2 hour long movie cannot really cover 6 volumes of books. While there are many minor differences, I've chosen a few that I think have the most significance. These include Lisa Miller not existing in the movie, the film taking place over a few weeks while the books take over a year, 
In the book, Lucas Lee was arguably the least evil of the evil exes, since he didn't really have any interest in defeating Scott. In the movie, however, he was pretty malicious, let's be real. Also, a large portion of Envy's and Scott backstory was removed, and the entire fight with the twins went down completely differently in the comic. I don't really want to get into much detail about how it was changed, so I advise you to check it out for yourself. There are also two changes that I personally think that have most significance. The concept of the glow in subspace. For those who haven't read the comic, a subspace is basically Ramona's ability to travel through dimensions, which is also the reason why she appeared in Scott's dreams so much. Meanwhile, the glow, it's a pretty hard concept to explain, but as the fandom wiki states it, it's a weaponized form of emotions created by Gideon Graves that uses subspace to trap someone inside their own mind with their personal demons. And while I think that the glow and the subspace were all great concepts, I also think that it was for the best for them to edit those. I mean, the glow was actually changed to the microchip that was shown by the end of the movie. The subspace was just briefly mentioned by Ramona once. And yeah, you can still think that a microchip replacing an emotional weapon is a bit cheap, but I stand my ground. I think that the original concepts could be pretty confusing for a two hour long movie. The books. Well, not much here to explain to be honest. It's just about the game and the movie being based on a series of comic books. And I assume you would have guessed it by now, considering that my video literally started with me saying that it's a series of comic books. Plum Tree Song. It's a reference to the fact that Scott's name actually comes from a plum tree song. As you can probably tell, the song itself was an inspiration for the title character in the series. The exes respawn after death. As funny as it sounds, it's true. Many people have been wondering if the exes actually die after being defeated. And according to Brian Lee O'Malley, they simply respawn at their houses. What I also personally enjoy about this idea is that upon respawning, the exes lose the urge to take revenge on Scott. So yeah, they basically learned a lesson and chill. Steven Stills is gay. Even though it was never addressed in the movie, Steven Stills comes out as gay to his friends. Funny enough, some people theorize that it may have been shown subtly in the movie. To be specific, in the song Garbage Truck, you can hear the line, I'll take out your junk, which I assume that you could have guessed by now, was a reason for some people to believe that he was actually singing about a man's junk. Whether or not it's true, I think it's a pretty funny way of thinking about it. According to Brian Leo Mali, Steven Sills is also gay in the movie, he was just not ready to come out yet. Scott Pilgrim vs The Animation So, for this one, let's come back to the changes the movie brought for a second. Remember when I have mentioned that Lisa Miller got deleted from the movie? Well, we kind of have something to make up for that. Well, soon after the movie was released, Adult Swim of Old Studios actually animated a short film which depicted Lisa Miller and a few more scenes that weren't shown in the movie. Neil Young and Steven Stills Both of these guys actually carry the exact same names as popular musicians. Both the real Neil Young and the real Steven Stills used to be a part of the group called Buffalo Springfield. And well, that's basically it. Not much here to say, really. With that, we're finally finished layer 2. That was pretty quick. So now let's move on to layer 3. Kevin Katayanagi. In this Scott Pilgrim game, Kyle and Ken both essentially have the same design. The color palette here is the only real difference. It is most likely a reference to how all the games did their designs. Ken's name also has been changed to Kevin. It's most likely a reference to the mistranslation of Bimmy and Jimmy in Double Dragon. Some believe it may be a tribute to the Street Fighter character, Kevin Stryker. Scott Pilgrim's Little Life This is the title of the original draft script for the movie. It has been strongly changed, resulting in the current script. One of the most notable differences was the Kredzilla, which I have mentioned before. Oh, there are some things that I will list further down below. Ken and birthdays. Again, not much here to explain to be honest. Brian posted some concepts for the dates of birth for the main characters. Some of them are specific dates, while others resemble approximations more than anything. So this is basically it. Roxy explodes into animals instead of coins. Again, pretty much self-explanatory here. The fourth evil X turns into a bunch of cute animals upon being defeated, though this only happens in the game and the comic. Free Scott Pilgrim It's a short story released on a free comic day. 
the story takes place somewhere between books 3 and 4. Considering it's not too high on the iceberg, I'm not gonna spoil it for you. So please, go read it for yourself. As always with Scott Pilgrim, I assure you it's pretty funny. Scott Pilgrim ruined a whole generation of women. It's a title of the song made by Negative XP. It's essentially a critique of Manic Pixie Dream Girls and blaming Ramona's existence for this sudden trend. Not much here to explain. Go ahead and listen to it on your own. Ramona's natural hair color. Since we never see her natural hair color, many people have been wondering what it actually looks like. Brian Lee O'Malley stated that she dyed it so much that she barely remembers herself. Although he also stated that his guess would be somewhat of a light blondish brown. Extended garbage truck black sheep footage. There is an extended version of these songs, although honestly, I couldn't really find much about them. But if you do manage to find something, please leave a comment down below. And that's it for our third layer. So now it is time to move on to the layer 4. Clash at Demon Head is an NES game. Again, not much here to speak about. Clash at Demon Head is actually a title of a game which was produced for the Nintendo Entertainment System. Young Neil was originally supposed to be a 9 year old. One of the first concepts of Young Neil included him being a little 9 year old. This idea ended up being scrapped though, and the whole thing of a young kid in a band ended up being used on Trasher. Brian O'Malley decided that it would be more interesting this way. Honestly, I think that the idea of Scott being in a band with a 9 year old also would have its charm though. Lucas Lee movies named after Plum Tree songs. In the movie it is stated that Lucas Lee is actually an actor and we see some of the movies he's played in, titles of which are actually titles of Plum Tree songs. Of course not all of them, but most of them. The Deadly Sins theming. Although before I start, I want to say that this is actually a theory written by Flyby Tie-Dye on Reddit and everything that I'll be saying right now is a quick synopsis of what they've written. I will provide a link to their posts in the description, so I highly recommend you check it out. So. Some people theorize that the seven evil exes are actually supposed to represent the seven deadly sins. Starting with Matthew Patel, people believe that he actually represents pride. One of the reasons for that might be that number one is generally considered to be the one for winners and people with a lot of pride would generally want to be the first at everything. He's also generally pretty cocky and full of himself. Like, for example, he got mad at Scott for not reading his email, as if it was so obvious that everyone should pay attention to him. He also took a lot of pride in his appearance. As for Lucas Lee, it is said that he might represent Sloth. The movie represented it differently, in the graphic novels he wasn't interested in fighting Scott at all. He even decided to take a break in the middle of the fight, though his character got changed a lot in the movie. However, some of the things that he has done in the movie can still be interpreted as his Sloth. For instance, at first, he had his doubles fight for him instead of fighting himself. Next up is Todd Ingram. Some people decided that he should be a glutton, although the theory I am basing my video off decides that he rather should be represented by Wrath. For example, he's full of insecurities, which he manifests in his powers. He also decided that a good way of expressing love would be by destroying things. Like making a fucking gratin. Also in the comic, Todd and Envy keep setting up this test for Scott in order to embarrass and humiliate him. Also, Todd is actually the only one who destroyed the entire location he fought with Scott in. Also, even though it went down differently in the comic, Todd actually ends up punching knives. And well, hitting a 17 year old girl who you don't even know when you're a 20 something year old guy would be pretty unimaginable for most. But here we are with Todd and his anger issues. Now for the Roxy Richer. People theorize that she's supposed to represent lust. It's also unfortunate that she's supposed to represent lust, especially since homosexual relationships are actually seen as lustful by most people, and it's a very much hurtful stereotype. Though there are several things that might actually point that that's not the case here at all. There are simply other arguments that can lead to thinking that she's supposed to represent lust. Like, for example, she sleeps in the same bed as Ramona and makes out with her, even though she knows that she's supposed to be with Scott. Also, her past relationship with Ramona has been described as sexy face and the whole you punch me in the boob thing. While I feel like this one may be a bit of a stretch, I can see it making sense. As for the Kataya Nagi twins, they are basically the same character so it would be pretty hard to choose a different sin for each of them, especially since they have no dialogue in the movie, which we'll get into later. 
But anywho, most likely the best fitting sin for them is envy. Especially considering that Ramona was dating the both of them to make them jealous of each other. They also attempt to make Ramona jealous of Scott by luring him into a trap by kidnapping Kim. Another thing I'd like to mention is that in the Scott Pilgrim's Little Life, which I know is just a scrapped out idea, but there, Kataya Nagi twins actually lose the fight with Scott because their jealousy tears them apart. And while this may not be too much evidence, I think that this is still the best fitting scene of all. Now for our little star, Gideon Graves. He is most likely represented by Greed. I guess that also means you could call him Gradian. Did you get it? I mean, you can see the guy is rich as fuck. He also ends up dropping the largest amount of coins. The amount that he's dropped is also uncomparable to the rest. It's just notably higher. Also, what I think that matters here too, is that he literally mind controls Ramona, which would probably not be the case with any given romance. He visibly treats Ramona as a plaything and as a trophy, and not really as a potential sexual or romantic partner. I think that all those combined paint a really good picture of greed. So at this point, you may have realized that I've only explained six of them and not seven deadly sins, and here's why. The theory that I've borrowed basically all my points from suggests an interesting thing. It could be Scott who represents gluttony. Apart from the fact that we do see him eating a lot, which I don't personally think should be that big of an argument here, he seems to be mooching off Wallace a lot. We basically see other people buy food for him like all the time, especially Wallace. And this whole argument might sound a bit trivial in comparison to the last ones, but also I think gluttony is generally seen as the most trivial sin, and since Scott isn't officially in the League of Evil Exes, it can be seen that he fits the gluttony thing pretty well. But the biggest argument here is that he said that he could eat garlic bread all the time, for every single meal. If that is not enough evidence for you, then I don't know what will be. Wallace Weldon in the first book, we can see a mailbox right beside Wallace's apartment. However, his last name is spelled as Weldon instead of Wells. The sole reason for that is because his last name simply was changed into Wells later on. The main campus library at Weston, where Brian Leo Murley studied, is actually called Weldon. Some fans also speculate that he actually could have been named Weldon in the past and changed his last name into Wells when drunk, but it's just a speculation. For a version of Summertime. Summertime is a song made by Sex Bobomb. It only appears in the movie for like 5 seconds before being interrupted and can only be heard later on during the end credits. Despite officially appearing in the movie only for a few seconds, the entire music video is still available on YouTube, even though the full scene never made it into the movie. Comic Festival Shots for those who don't know, Comic Festival is a special event that happens in Toronto, the main idea of which is to encourage people to read more comic books. For this event, Brian Lee O'Malley actually wrote two extra stories, including the characters from the Scott Pilgrim franchise. One of them is actually centered around Kim Pine. I'm not gonna spoil it for you, so go read it on your own. Scott being tied to a zero. Even though Scott isn't technically a part of the Evil Exes League, it is believed that he may be represented by a number zero. This is mostly due to the fact that we've seen him wear a t-shirt with a zero on it. It is also stated that his favorite drink is Coke Zero. Right after defeating Roxy, Ramona says that Scott may be an Evil Ex waiting to happen. During this conversation, he's wearing a t-shirt with four and a half on it, which also would make sense considering that he's just defeated the Evil Ex number four. Furthermore, right before Gideon turns into a pile of coins, he tells Scott that he's zero in nothing. Todd is a Scott parallel. Now, it's pretty common in media to create characters who are supposed to be a representative of what a different character might become. This form of projectability often fuels a character's growth. Some people are led to believe that Todd actually might be a representative of Scott's flaws and show what he might become if he doesn't change his ways. This is mostly due to the fact that one of Scott's biggest flaws was not being loyal, which is also what Todd is all about. Also, even the name Todd sounds a bit similar to Scott, and they play the same instrument. This may not exactly be the most believable evidence there, but I think it still makes sense. So, we've just finished layer 4. So, as you can probably imagine, now it's time for layer 5. Launchpad Mock Quack is an actual song. 
Launchpad or Quark is the song that Sex Bobomb performs in front of knives for the first time. And while the movie version doesn't contain any lyrics, they are actually listed in a comic. They never made it to the movie because Brian O'Malley stated that he didn't actually really like them and thought they were really bad. And before you start crucifying me in the comments, I do realize that Launchpad Mokwok isn't the actual title of the song, but it is never really revealed and is listed as We Are Sex Bobomb on the tracklist. Exes slash ex-boyfriend's discrepancy I believe one of the most memorable scenes in the movie was the one when Scott finally asked Ramona why she's so insistent, saying exes instead of ex-boyfriends. Obviously, as it later turns out, it was because, well, she used to be dating Go. Thing is, in the comic, Soma during the first volume actually calls them ex-boyfriends herself. This is not like a major plot hole that destroys the whole comic, but I think it's still pretty funny. The entire Scott Pilgrim vs. The World script is on Genius. As you can probably imagine, this is a simple reference to the fact that the entire script can be found on Genius.com. And for those who happen to be unaware, Genius is actually a site that is made for publishing lyrics of songs. So it's a pretty random fact that the entire script is there. Online Avatar Creator The official Scott Pilgrim site used to have a creator of avatars for fans to use. However, since the site doesn't exist anymore, the creator itself also vanished. Honestly, this is something that really made me sad because during my research I couldn't find anything and I was so excited to find the creator. But I asked the person who made the iceberg and they told me it's off. <laughs> it really broke my heart. Anyway, moving on. Pilgrim's Punch Out. Pilgrim's Punch Out is a game that was created for iPods, iPhones and iPads. As you can probably guess, it existed mostly for the promotion of the movie. And while I never got to play this game, from what I'm seeing it's a simple fight game with rather simple mechanics and a few cutscenes. Much like Scott Pilgrim vs The World the game, it has been delisted from the Xbox Live Arcade and PlayStation Network, but also it disappeared from the App Store. So, from what I'm seeing, it is still considered lost media, but who knows, maybe someone will actually find it one day. Or it was already found and I'm just done. NVS X number 4 As you can probably remember, I mentioned before that a draft that wasn't used for the movie exists. It contains major differences in comparison to what actually came out of the story. One of which is the fact that Envy was supposed to be the fourth X. And yeah, for me it's pretty hard to imagine what the story would have to go down like for this to even be a thing. But it also really catches my curiosity. I mean, I would love to see some more scraps and drafts of those, just to see how the story evolved during the making process. I don't know, it just really entices me. Nega Knives Even though we never see her like this in a movie or the comic, this evil form of knives actually exists in the game. That's basically it. <laughs> Style Style is the title of the comics that was very briefly written by Brian Leo Murley. And by briefly, I mean there exist like three strips at all. The only reason this is included on this iceberg is that Kim was actually supposed to be the main character. Seth Rogen was going to play Scott. The director of the movie stated that the studio suggested that Scott should be played by Seth Rogen. And while this is not much to dwell on, I personally think that this is a pretty funny thing considering that Seth Rogen and Michael Sarah have a completely different vibe. And while I hold nothing against Seth Rogen, I still think that this is a good thing that he didn't get casted. Some people consider Michael Sarah to be a bit too awkward to play Scott, but I personally very like him as an actor and I think he did his job. The fanbase hated Ramona. The fourth book sparked a lot of controversy among the fans. The main reason for this was Ramona's hypocrisy. She got extremely mad at Scott for reconnecting with Lisa, while also being guilty of cheating on Scott with Roxy before. A lot of people started saying that Scott should end up with Kim. And yeah, I personally love Ramona, but I also can't help but understand their perspective. I think that generally homosexual relationships are treated a bit less serious by the media. And this is also the reason why Brian Lee or Molly might have taken the cheating part a bit too lightly. But the general critique towards Ramona also was the main reason why the book number 5 focuses on her so much. It seems like the author wanted to show that she is actually worthy of being with Scott, considering that Scott himself is also a very flawed character. Of course, I do not mean to be rude or slander the author at all. I still consider Scott Pilgrim to be a rather progressive form of media. This is also the reason why I appreciate the fans' reaction so much. I think it's a great thing that the author realized his mistake and decided to act on it. 
And on that note, we've just finished layer 5. So it is now time to begin level 6. Ramona was Gideon's assassin. As I have already mentioned, Scott Pilgrim's Little Life was an unused draft that was supposed to be the script for the movie. And as I have also mentioned before, it contains a lot of differences. One of them was actually Ramona's role in the story. According to this draft, Ramona was originally supposed to be an assassin hired by Gideon to kill Scott. Again, this is just a draft that was never used in a story, but yeah, I still think this concept on its own would be really cool. Eleanor During the making process, Brian Leo O'Malley considered giving young Neil a girlfriend. She was supposed to be this unconventional, cute, quirky girl, and according to the wiki, she was supposed to wear colored lenses and was supposed to have short hair. It is also said that she was going to try put makeup on Neil, which I personally think is a very cute idea. Later on, Eleanor was referred to as Liney, but the whole idea ended up being deleted and never implemented in the franchise. And honestly, I think that it's a shame that they didn't use this character. I think she sounds genuinely fun. And even though young Neil himself didn't really have much spotlight, I think that a character like this would really benefit the humor. And we cheated on Todd with Scott. It is stated in the comic that right before Todd left for the vegan academy, Envy told him that she was going to stay faithful to him no matter what. However, we also find out that she was dating Scott at this time. This is the reason why people are led to believe that she was actually unfaithful to Todd. Scott Pilgrim the movie.com as I have mentioned before, scottpilgrim.com was the site which was mostly used for the promotion of the movie. And even though some people considered the movie to be somewhat of a classic, the site itself is lost to time. Not much else to explain here. Lucas is in Tony Hawk 4. In Scott Pilgrim's Little Life, Mother Scott offhandedly mentions that Lucas Lee was in Tony Hawk 4. That's about it. The glow was hastily written. Brian Lee O'Malley stated that he was actually very proud of the last book and generally considered it to be a great ending to the story. However, he also considered the glow to be overly complicated and overall too hard to understand in the first reading. And while I personally really like the concept of the glow, I think it's rather undeniable that it was very hard to understand for most people and was generally pretty poorly explained in the story itself. I actually only understood it fully after I read the wiki page on it. Why the Katayanagis don't speak in the movie? As I have mentioned before, the Katayanagis are very different characters to their counterparts in the comic. And while most people assume that the fight scene has been so dramatically changed just for the sake of the movie's length, the truth is actually a lot more random and funny. Most people probably realize that the Katayanagis never said a single word in the movie. Is the producers wanted to have actual Japanese people play the Katayanagis, but also they forgot to put the information that you need to know English in order to be casted, and when they realized their mistake, it was already too late. So yeah, as you can probably guess by now, the actors simply don't know English. And while some people also say that the information was actually there, they simply chose to go with these two actors instead of looking for someone else who actually knows English. I still think that the biggest bombshell of this story is that the actors legitimately don't know the language, so I personally don't think it really matters whether it was on the pamphlet or not. So on a comedic note, we've just finished layer 6. Only one layer left ahead of us. The layer 7. Montreal Campaign DLC as we already know, Scott Pilgrim is a franchise that is full of scrapped out ideas, one of which was the Montreal Campaign DLC. This specific DLC for the Scott Pilgrim vs. the game, what the fuck did I just say? The Scott Pilgrim vs. the world, the game, was supposed to add Envy, Todd and Lynette from Clash at Demon Head as playable characters. However, it was never released. According to Brian Leo Molly himself, it was cut out due to budget reasons. And while the characters are still available in the game as bosses, it's still a shame that they didn't get included. Gideon is the cat. Somewhere between the book 5 and 6, some fans have sparked a theory that Ramona's cat, Gideon, was actually the same as the Gideon we meet at the end. People claim that the human Gideon might have had the ability to turn into a cat to spy on Ramona and Scott. As funny as this theory sounds, it is actually referenced in the last comic book. During the fight with Gideon, he mentions that he's been watching Ramona and Scott do stuff, on which Scott comments that he must have been the captain. Of course, this is later debunked by Gideon himself, but it's still a pretty funny way of implementing a fan theory in your story. Ramona's dead brother during the interviews after the movie aired, each actor has been asked to reveal a few secrets of the character they played. 
Mary Elizabeth Winstead, the actress who played Ramona, revealed that Ramona used to have a younger brother who died, and now she wears his shoelaces around her neck in his memory. However, later on, Brian Lee O'Malley stated that this is not considered canon and he's never implemented in the story in any way, and he himself doesn't consider it a part of her backstory. He also stated that the secrets revealed at this time were all jokes and generally shouldn't be considered canon. Official Peanut Valentine's Art because of the Valentine's Day in 2012, Brian Leo Molly posted an official pinup art, including Wallace, Lisa, Ramona, and Kim. That's about it here. Look alike, not safe for work artist. There was a time when Brian Leo Molly was supposedly drawing not safe for work art and was basically bombarded by questions about it on his Twitter. As it turns out, someone simply had a very similar art style to Brian Leo Molly, and yeah, drew not safe for work art. And while it wasn't this huge drama that changed his career forever, I simply think it's pretty funny. Like, I can't imagine one day just waking up and people asking me if I drew not safe for work art, simply because someone happened to have a similar art style to mine. Scott was going to end up alone. This happens to be something that I have already spoiled before, but I also don't really think that this should be so low on the iceberg. It's just about how the original ending was supposed to have Scott end up alone, not dating either Ramona or Knives or Kim or anyone else. And now, most people would probably be pretty sad if he ended up not dating Ramona, since, let's be real, the obsession with Ramona is just... <sighs> But to be honest, I can see that kind of ending working out. While I certainly wouldn't want Scott dating knives in the end, I think that him being single is actually a pretty good ending on its own. Scott was portrayed as a very flawed character from the start as well as Ramona was. And I think I can imagine this story ending with a note of, oh, we need to work on ourselves before we get into relationships. And with the ending like that, I think it would have been a pretty sad story, I mean considering how much Scott went through with Ramona, but I also think that the moral of the story would have been very, very concrete I guess. What I'm trying to say, it would have been a cautionary tale in this case and it could have worked. Coin killer ending. I won't be lying, this is the part I was the most hyped about. The coin killer ending was an unshot alternative ending to the movie. It was supposed to be revealed that the video game aspect of the story was actually all in Scott's head. The idea was that he was actually a murderer who would leave coins on the murder sites. It would have ended with Scott being arrested on the news for killing Gideon. And yeah, that's pretty horrifying. So on that terrifying note, we'll finish the iceberg. Thank you so much for watching, I really hope you enjoyed this video. I'm not exactly planning on making anything else besides this one video, but who knows, maybe someday I will. And just for a nice ending, I want to thank Flyby Tie-Dye and Night Fury Witch once again. These guys greatly contributed to the making of this video. So yeah, thanks again so much and see you next time.